Hi, welcome to Shaking Sports Journeys. Um, we've had one podcast since taking a, taking a bit of a break. Um, and here I am with a second podcast coming to you. And this one's an interesting one. And um, there's a massive time difference between me and this gentleman on screen. Um, and just for the viewers, this chap that I'm speaking with today is an ex Black Caps test and ODI cricketer. Um, very successful opening bowler, both lovely, lovely outswingers at brisk pace as well. And very handy with a cricket bat in his hand as well. So I say hello to Dion Nash in New Zealand. How are you, sir? Really good, really good. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Now, we'll let the viewers know just now. Um, so this podcast got to, got brought together by a good friend of mine, somebody, friend of friend of Dion's as well, uh, somebody who I played quite a bit of cricket with when I was over in lovely uh, Final Ray in uh, New Zealand. And that's a, a chap called Joey Jovic, who played for Northern Districts, another very, very good all-rounder. He brought us and connected us, myself and Dion, together probably about a month ago, maybe just over. We've been working hard to get this podcast in place. And I'll put my hands up and say that I completely got the time zone messed up. <laughs> was meant to record and I didn't turn up. So my apologies it's on screen. I always put my hands up when I make a mistake. But no, it's a, it's a, it's an absolute pleasure to to have you. And how's how's life in uh, in New Zealand? Really good. It's not the first time I've been stood up either, so don't feel too bad about that. <laughs> um, no, really good. And and thanks. A good shout out to young Joey Jovic. Joey. Um, and I grew up together up north. He was a couple of years behind me, but a, a fantastic cricketer in his own right. So good on him for into uh, and for connecting us. But um, yeah, no, nice to nice to be here. Um, New Zealand's in lockdown at the moment, so any distraction is a, is a good distraction to um, fill in our days. With um, I think it's the only time the dogs are getting sick of going for walks. So <laughs> so we're we're all looking for things to do. Well. I'm going to take you through a wee snippet journey of your uh, your life and your career today. Looking forward to hearing hearing all about it. But I want to take you back, so get your memory tested and, and, and chat to you about your childhood, where you grew up, a little bit more about your family background, etc. Yeah, cool. A small town, um, way up in Northland, New Zealand. So New Zealand runs quite long longitudinal uh, lines. So we grew up right at the top where it's a bit warmer and um, a bit more wild. We pride ourselves on being a bit more rebellious up the north. So um, <clears throat> um, small town, 5,000 people. And, uh, you know, things you talk about timing, but luck and timing. And at the time when I grew up in the, well, in the, in the 70s, really, in the early 80s up there, um, there was there was six senior club cricket teams in a town of five thousand people, so um, which is just unheard of. There's not even one team there now in the same town. So um, <clears throat> you know, just got this little microcosm of of cricket in a small little pocket of New Zealand at, at a certain time, um, which was which was really lucky. But growing up in the north was pretty cool. And a lot of um, outdoors adventures, um, a lot of sort of just running wild. Uh, and west coast beaches and and things like that and pretty much everyone played rugby in the winter and cricket in the summer and and you know just just loved the outdoors did you um you strike me as i know you've played a few different sports we'll go and we'll talk about some of them later as well but were you quite a strike me as probably quite a multi-talented guy did you did you put your hand to quite a few different sports um yeah so my parents were um were sports people I guess so, so my father was a boxer and rugby player um, nice. and he was a sort of a outdoorsy man we had he owned a timber mill and a farm so we were you know he, loved, he was a man of the land so to speak and my mother she came from a slightly more demure side her, her family were tailors um, and um, but she was a netball player she she had an unfortunate um, uh, thing happen all my parents did when mum was about 22 she got she went in to get her appendix out and um and they um, they had a, a mishap and she ended up being par paralyzed oh dear so 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 mum got sort of cut short a little bit in terms of her you know sport um at a young age but um probably she never she still had that mental mind she's a great she loved her netball and her marching and things like that so so in a way um, mum not being able to do things later in life and when we all got into it i think you know she she was able to 
to live out some of their sporting through through us. Um, but um, yeah, so for me growing up, I think really I was pushed down the rugby track. You know, I was a pretty good rugby player. Yeah, when I was young, and everyone in New Zealand grows up wanting to be an All Black. So um, you know, that was the. I remember my two standout things from from growing up of watching, getting up in the middle of the night to watch. Um, New Zealand, the All Blacks play like um, either Wales or Ireland or, or England, you know. Um, don't forget just, Scotland, Dion. Don't forget yeah, Scotland. Scotland. <laughs> and Scotland, of course, of course, of course. But there's a, there's a classic one down here. The Scottish test I remember down here is the one in the wet, which you, if you ever, if you're a rugby person from Scotland, you'll remember it was the other. It would be the middle of the night for you guys, but it was in our daytime. We played this game against Scotland, and the All Blacks wore white, which was unusual, but it was also the Eden Park was just a wash with water, and it's this test where people could have drowned at the bottom of a of a ruck. You know, it should never have probably happened, but it was just amazing. It's worth going and checking out. But um, no, that would but, probably sorry. suited the Scots. That probably suited the Scots. <laughs> it sort of more. did, I think. Yeah, I think I think it did. I can't remember the score, so maybe I don't think you. I think we won, but anyway, it's um. But yeah, but I, my two memories of uh, yeah, so getting up in the middle of the night to watch that, and then the other one was you know watching Muhammad Ali, which I guess. He must have been right at the end of his career, but I remember having to sneak downstairs because to watch it because mum wouldn't let us watch it um, in the lounge. It was bad, boxing was banned in our house, so it was this clandestine sneaking down with dad to watch um, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> when I was, I don't know, must I must have only been five or six, but um, so I remember, I remember those standout sort of things. But cricket, so cricket really wasn't in my early days. It was not sort of there. Um, but I think probably the other thing I would say is that had a bit of an impact on me is I was the baby of six kids. So all of the kids had left sort of home and I, there's a bit of a gap between me and the next one. Um, so um, I think in a funny way, I, I sort of grew up a little bit like an only child in the sense that, you know, all the older kids were off doing their thing at boarding school and, and so on. And and so I was the only one at home and you know I just f was would get a ball and hit it against the wall over and over and over because I, I was bored um, you know and I think sometimes when you get get into sport you need something like that that it, you know where it's just repetition and um and that yeah. so um so yeah I mean that was it was a it was a cool place to grow up everyone and up there was into sport as I said earlier and so my first introduction to cricket was actually my my aunt, my cousin my my mother on my mother's side um he was a really keen cricketer um and he was right into the west indies at the time and and australia said so he had pictures of dennis lee and michael holding and so i vicariously got to know cricket through him so i didn't even know about richard hadley or or any of the new zealand players i only knew about these those west indian and and australian players um and and so that was sort of my introduction playing in the backyard with him and then at a certain point, I must have been about 11, um, I just remember my cousin pleading with my um, father to say, look, can he just come and play? We just, he just, he, and by that stage, I was already batting the whole of lunchtime, you know, at school. Um, yep. <laughs> so that classic sort of thing. So um, I went down and I played in my first game and, you know, took a bunch of wickets and scored some runs and never looked back. So yeah, you're quite a late bloomer then. You know, you never started at like seven, eight years old or anything. It wasn't your first. It wasn't your first sport. Your father. It wasn't really his background. So you know, you stumbled. You kind of stumbled, stumbled upon it. And and good on that cousin for for introducing you because you you, you didn't look back from there. Um, when did you start getting into playing rep cricket? Then when did like you know playing at a higher level in the junior in the junior rankings? Yeah, so it all happened relatively quickly. I remember I sort of played that first game and you know, I remember I mean what I remember is I remember my older brother I remember my older brother was a good rugby player so and he had a bit of a reputation in the district and um I remember my older cousin and uh, sorry, I remember a couple of friends of my older cousin watching my first game. And I remember them sort of talking loudly on the sideline and going, oh, that's David's cousin. And then the other one said, oh, that's John's brother. And I was like, you know, in that well of pride as, you, as you're getting recognised, I remember just, yeah. I, I still can feel it. 
you know, mm-hmm. and it's like, wow, people are talking about me, you know, and I remember that was more significant than making the rep teams in a way. And I remember thinking, wow, I must be quite good. This is a cool feeling. I like it. Um, and that was, pro- that was that very first game. I remember it. And, and then from there, I, I just, I don't remember making my first rep team, but it was pretty much, I'm, the, the thing about coming from a small place is, you know, you pretty quickly run to go to the top of that. And then because the way New Zealand, the New Zealand cricket structure is, where I was in in Northland, we actually <clears throat> part of Northern Districts, which goes from halfway up the North Island to the top, but it misses out Auckland in between. So it's this sort of strange setup. So I used to have to travel from right up the top, way down to Hamilton and Taupo, which is like, you know, back then was a five hour drive um, <clears throat> to play in the, the rep stuff. So um, I, I remember the first time was I was 13 when I first made that, northern districts team and no one from my area had made it you know it was like a, a bit of a unique yep. thing and so um and i remember falling asleep in the back of the car with my northern districts cap on my chest and waking up for five hours later you know back in my hometown and being able to tell my mates hey i made the team <laughs> so was that like a like a you know, the way had, was that a lot of talented areas, uh, regions that were brought together to then pick that Northern but, District team? Yeah, so you, it's a big area. So it's like, um, you know, you've got Hamilton and you've been and up to Northland and then you've got, you know, Bay of Plenty or Tauranga or all or, 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 you know, um, counties, Manukau. So you've got a big, vast area. But at that tournament, um, you know, I remember the first time I came across a guy called Matthew Hart who played he yeah, yeah. A spin, spin bowler for New Zealand. Um, yeah. At that stage, he was a, a fast bowler, left arm quick. And he bowled me out. And I remember coming off and I, 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 I swear I was crying. I, I, you know, it was just like, I just could not believe anyone could bowl that quick. It was just this, I was like, man, this is frightening. <laughs> yeah. It was like, and um, anyway. Especially at that age. Especially at that age, oh, when somebody's man, got a bit it of heat, just like, it's quite a, it's quite yeah. an eye opener. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was, and he and he really was quick. It was, um, he, he sort of gave up bowling fast when he was probably, oh, I don't know, four, fifteen, not that much later. But and but he was renowned throughout the country as being one of the quickest at that age, and he was really whippy. You know, that really sort of whippy left armour swung it a bit. And I was just like, I was like, man, if this, I, I'm not sure if I'm quite up for this. Um, but anyway, I we ended up being good mates and making the team together. And you know, it's sort of like you need those people on your journey. And he, I learned a lot off Matthew Hart. He was, um, he was a guy who had come from a cricketing background. His parents were right in it, you know. And and I, you know, just some of the history of the game and and just a little bit around you know, technique. I'd never had a coach, you know, a proper coach. And you know, he just I remember him telling me to play the ball under my nose, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. you know, you pick up pick up things quite late when you come from smaller areas, but when you do, you're like a sponge, you know, you sort of take it all on. So, um, yeah, it's a long time ago now. You, um, there's one thing that stands out. Now, I remember you very, very well. You're only, we're, we're not far off each other at an age, I'd imagine. So I watched a lot of you play cricket. And you say you weren't coached or anything else, and it doesn't surprise me because you struck struck me when I watched, in particular when I used to watch a ball. You had a beautiful rhythmic action. It just looked like very natural. And then obviously, as I mentioned at the offset of the podcast, you bowled lovely outswingers. I'd imagine at your at your peak, probably mid and above high, could get up to high eighties when you wanted to. Yeah, I got clocked. I, I got clocked uh, uh, ninety. K playing when in that 99 series and that that was a 90 k 90 miles which i think was you know sort of in the 140s but i think yeah. uh, uh, you know i think that um and and probably when i was younger before i had my back injury i was i, I think i was bowling quick quicker than i did at the end you know obviously you know before you get injury but it's a, it's one of those things it's like i think that some players hit the bat harder than others you know yep. and i always what i what i prided pride prided myself on is you know hitting the bat hard and um you know if people aren't rocking back and pulling you generally you know that you know you you've got a little bit of heat into it um and, and i think that 
bowling late as well. Sometimes, you know, like you, I'd take Waka and Wazim are quite classic. Like, you know, Waka through the year was the quickest, but, um, you know, Wazim bowled so late in his action that he actually cut down your reaction time, um, you know, and you actually, as a batter, that's almost worse than quickness through the year. Um, and I think some, so that sort of combination of like, you know, trying to come right over the top of your action just, just gives you that, that heat. But I, I also, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I just loved the adrenaline of bowling, you know, like that was the, the thing I loved. I loved when you were fit and strong and had your tail up and we're running in and was and it just all felt good, you know, and you're just getting that kiss and, and it just felt easy. So I loved the athleticism of it, I think, you know, that was probably, and I think most bowlers, there's a, or, or maybe all rounders is more the, the athlete of the, of the game, you know what I mean? Um, I, I sort of loved that side of it. I always remember playing when I was about 18, I played a game against Australia for New Zealand President's Eleven and New Plymouth and um, Craig McDermott was on the sideline. He was, wasn't playing in the game, he was in the Australian team, but he, he was just watching, you know, the game. And he said, he, he said to Chris Pringle, he said, who's the guy who runs in like Michael Holding and bowls like Danny Morrison? <laughs> and I was like, and he was talking about me and I was, I must, and I, was, I always thought, oh, that's, that must be what I look like when I'm bowling. But um, I don't know. Cool. Danny, Listen, I'd take that. I'd, probably, <laughs> it I probably offends that. both probably offends both of them but i can sort of see what he meant you know it was sort of like a bit of a a, a, a rhythmical run up and then maybe not so rhythmical action but anyway no you were you, it was it was i mentioned to my father actually big big cricket fan not long before i came i think yesterday i was chanting and i said to him i'm going to be a god and i said your name and he said straight away oh he's a very very nice bowler like really nice action and so you know it's, it's amazing i find it amazing for such a small country how many, I mean, you obviously played and, and really sad news that we have just received and, and, and found out obviously regarding probably one of the greatest all-rounders to play the game. And that's that's Chris Cairns and, and you played, you will probably have played quite a bit of cricket with Chris Cairns, um, but very sad news as well in the in the last last few days that he's, um, he, he, he's I believe, paralysed, um, which is, 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 is very sad. Yeah, we're not quite sure how bad it is. So fingers crossed. I mean, it, it's um he's had a stroke. He's had, obviously had a, a big heart, um you know, operation. He um a birthday order in his heart. So he's had multiple operations to try and stitch all that up. And then, um, in part as part of that, and I, I think it's uh, he's had a mild stroke. Well, well, when I say mild, he's had a stroke um uh, that has caused yeah paralysis of his legs. And I guess I'm just like many are just hoping that it's on the milder end. I don't have any information at all other than that than what is in the media, but you know, you just hope that it's one of those situations he can get some of the feeling or all of the feeling back eventually. Um, yeah, I, I, so. I don't know. Prayers, prayer, prayers are with him. It's, um, but what a player. Like you, I mean, he's the kind of guy that must have just demanded the respect and the change him. He was just a giant of a man and he, what an all rounder. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, well, Kenzie was like um, a couple of years older than me. I always find that um, it's funny when you talk about your contemporaries because because it's always difficult. You know, people. Um, it's like a, 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 a cricket teams are, are sort of like um, you know mo having having multiple relationships all at once. You know, you you sort of get to know people so well. And back then, we, we used to room with each other. You know, it's not like today where you get your own room and you can go and play PlayStation for six hours by yourself. Is PlayStation even a thing? I don't think that's a thing anymore. Listen, I played, listen, I, listen, <laughs> listen, I played for Scotland. We still have to share a room. We don't, we, we don't, we don't, we don't get that luxury. <laughs> but but you know, like you you live in each other's pockets and um. And, and it's one of those things you're not, you, you're mates, but you're also competing for some, for the same spot. Um, you're competing with your own egos against each other because you want, you all think you're the better cricketers. Um, and so um, for Kenzie and for many of us actually in that time, it probably took us five or six years of playing together to really work out how to coexist. Um, and I think that the New Zealand team in the early to mid nineties was really struggling with that. We had no leadership. Um, we had, you know, um, we had no management 
sort of structure that was really tying it all together. Um, and we had a lot of bunch of young guys in their, in their mid twenties who were sort of struggling with growing up really, you know, that we were talented players, but um, you know, had, had lots of baggage from different, all from different quarters and, and trying to pull all that together was nigh on impossible, you know? And I think that um, I, I don't, think i'm speaking out of turn by saying you know if it hadn't have been for the for, for the late 90s and and you know the management of sort of guys like a guy john graham and gilbert anoka and, and, a, and a chairman of new zealand cricket a guy called chris doig who pulled it all together and really understood what what young men were about and what what was required to be you know to perform at the highest level chris chris doig was an opera singer and he'd come into the and, and so knew an entertainment he knew structure and and things like that in business and then you had john graham who was an ex all black captain and gilbert anoka was a sight guy back then it was like considered oh you must have some problems if you had a sight guy now everyone's got one but he was he was much more than that he was um you know he was a team builder and and understood the dynamics of the team and then you had um you know steve rickson who came in from australia who's a bloody minded ocker who just didn't have any of the politics or rubbish of the past and just wanted to win uh, and it was this brutal combination of really that pulled us up by our strip, you know, up by the sort of top of our head and just said, right, guys, here's the top of the tent. You guys are all playing down at the bottom. We need to sort this out. And I think Chris was a large part of, of that. Like he he was one of those guys who grew the most, um, as did I, as did everyone in there. Um, and we stopped sort of looking across at each other and started looking up at, you know, where the tent, where the top of the tent was and what direction we're trying to go as a group. Um and I think once that all sort of started to happen, you saw guys like Kenzie and and, um, and and many others, you know, really start to get the best out of themselves and flourish as cricketers. And, and it's no, um, you know, it's not by chance, I don't think, that sort of that late 90s, early 2000s, you know, New Zealand cricket team started to really um, hit its straps and get it together, you know. And, and Kenzie, I, I was pr I'm proud to say, was a huge part in that you know his talent no one ever questioned but he sort of started to come right as a as a leader and as a man and um and and we all grew and and got respect for each other as, as cricketers you know and um you've got you know guys like nathan astle and adam Poirier and stephen fleming and roger twos and you know many others i've missed probably half of the half the team there so you always defend someone when you say these things but you know, they, they were all, there wasn't one or two leaders, it was a team of leaders, you know, and um, and then the young, you know, the young guys in that group were the Macmillans and the, the Tories, who then obviously in their own right came through and became the leaders in the next group. Yeah, it's, I, oh, you, you say that, but it's amazing then that, I mean, my memory goes back to the 1992 World Cup, and I've got Pakistani background in me, so obviously it was a fantastic <laughs> World Cup for us, but New Zealand, even made the semi-final of that World Cup. And that's the thing that I always find with the Kiwis there. They, they, they don't necessarily... Uh, now we're talking about New Zealand, and I think if, you, if they go into a tournament now, now you're actually talking about them like, the Kiwis could win this tournament, or they could be, got the, you know, the number one, won the Test Championship, and now they've got bowlers, cup, fast bowlers galore. You know, it's it's but back then, it didn't... It, you always seemed to manage to front up as, as, a, as a nation and as people... But you think that was obviously a real change, getting some actual proper management and structure and evolving people as, for, as individuals, that by the time you went into the likes of 99 World Cup, you were a far better um, squad and more together. Yeah, I mean, well, 92, we all take huge pride in 92, you know, and, and Inza Mum will forever be, our, you know, in our minds as the guy who destroyed all of New Zealand's hopes. Um, but you know what a great story of that '92. You know, Marin Khan and and the Pakistan story of then was incredible, right? So you can't take anything away. But um, but for New Zealand, it broke our hearts. But and that but that group that was the end of an era of a group. You know, after that you had uh, multiple retirements, um, and then the guys who sort of stayed on. Um, there was a whole lot of internal politicking between the coaches and power plays between players and things, and so. You know the guys who didn't retire not that much later the 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 internal situation of New Zealand cricket wasn't it wasn't healthy for a young player to come into and, and that's a that's the situation that guys like myself and Adam Poirier and 
um, you know, Chris Kenza, Stephen Fleming, we all sort of came into this um, environment where you did, weren't really sure which, which political camp you were, should have been part of, you know, and, yeah. and that's not a very nice environment to be in. Um, and I think that we sort of inherited that because those guys then sort of all retired and then it was our time. And then we just, all we had was we thought we were stars, but we hadn't achieved it. We hadn't done anything to, to warrant that. Um, or or we'd, we'd, perhaps we'd done something, but we certainly didn't understand how to maintain and be professional cricketers at, at that level. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I'm only really talking about my era because what to get to what they did in 92, there were some fantastic cricketers, fantastic leadership and, and awesome um, you know, you know, things that happened to achieve that. Um, but So you can only really talk about the, the experience and bubble that you had, but I know that from when I started to when I finished, definitely that structure and that that was the change that that really lifted us um and 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 just gave us a common direction um i think um you know in 99 that was sort of the start of our belief starting to come together you know we again we actually got knocked out by pakistan um but it was a game that i never thought we were going to win you know if i'm honest i we um we 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 didn't get enough runs and we we're always you know, we're always 30 runs too short of where we needed to be to, to, to defend a total. And it just felt like the game was always slipping away from us. It never felt like we were properly in that fight. Um, as much as we played really good cricket in the tournament to get to that game, you know. Um, and I think to, I think also when you play at international level, certain teams get the wood on you and they get stuff over you. And I think Waka and Wazim um, and, and, you know, Inzamam and some of those players from that era in Pakistan had Say Danwar, Danwar was the one that got a hundred in that yeah. semi and it was flawless. Yeah. I mean he was a yeah. serious player. But yeah you're right. Yeah. Uh, you were probably 20, 30 short in that semi final. Yeah, yeah. And and you know um and look they they you know they definitely um had the wood on us. You know we just struggled to beat Pakistan it was and the, you know we've struggled to beat South Africa as another team we struggled to beat pretty much anyone else in the world we could come even Australia we'd, we'd come up against and we're like right we've got this but Pakistan and South Africa for some reason every time we played those two teams it was just like it just felt like we just had not worked them out you know and mentally or or actually strategically either and um and they had worked us out so so whereas Australia you know, we could always get ourselves up for it. England, we're always up for it. India, always up for it. Um, you know, um, never never up for it against Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka for some reason. That was always a tough, tough game. <laughs> imagine but, um, that's a, I imagine that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different heat. story. I, I think they just we just wilted like little kiwi flowers in the in the Sri Lankan heat. Yeah. But um <clears throat> but um uh yeah, so I'm not sure where I was going with all of that, but it, it was like um it, it, you know that the, oh, the late nineties was sort of a little bit of a coming together, and and thankfully, what happened for us after that World Cup, we had a tour of England, um, and that was probably the time when we really, because we knew we hadn't gone as far in that World Cup as we should have, or, or could have, maybe not should have, maybe could have, and so um, there was this little bit of unfinished business, and and I think we were able to then put that energy into that tour of England and we won in England for the, you know, which was a, a huge achievement, won at Lords for the first time and as a New Zealand team. And, and, you know, I think that if I didn't have that series, I probably wouldn't be able to say I had a proper cricket career. You know, um, it was that, that one series where all of a sudden you were just like, oh, thank God the monkey's off our back. You know, we're a good cricket team. Well, it was a good time to roll in because I imagine then that would be the performance of yours at the home of cricket Lords that is, a highly, um, people remember it very, very well, 10 wickets in the test and you scored a 50. Um, <laughs> you must have just been, you know, what age, what age were you then, Dion? Well, no, so yeah, so that was 94. So that was earlier. That was my, my coming of age as a, if you well, like. That, so that, was was, my, that, was, that was very early then. Yeah, that was 1994. So, um, and that was like, that, but that was that first proper test where you play and you go actually I'm good enough you know I can I can do this um and then I <clears throat> so I, so there was a yeah, the tour of England I, I just remember being a great series and you know I remember um Graham Gooch we played the first test Graham Gooch got 200 
and I'd never seen someone score 200 before up close. <laughs> I remember just thinking, um, how are we ever going to get this guy out? Um, it's just, you know, it just felt like an impossibility. And I, uh, but, but then we bounced back. And then the next, I think, I think in the next, in the rest of the series, I think I got him out five out of six times or something. And, um, oh. and he sort of, for a very short time, he, he became a bit of a bunny for me. But, you know, that's, um, I only say that in jest because he was such a great player. And I think he, I think I got him out pretty cheaply for four or five times and he still he probably averaged 45 for the series, you know. <laughs> so, so how were you getting him out? What was your, what was your tactics? I mean, he was very good, um, very good drive, pulled the ball very well as well. And he, good, you know, he was quite a bot, he was a boss at the crease. Yeah. He was quite a daunting figure. Yeah. Yeah, he was. He was intimidating. Yeah, I, I remember getting him at LBW a few times, so maybe he was just slipping across a little bit. And I think what I was doing is I was swinging the ball away um, and then the odd one. I never really had an in-swinger, but I, I, I sort of had the odd one that would I could get to go sort of straight. And I kept getting him with that, I think, because he'd play for the swing and it just didn't, didn't come. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you just, it's, it's, you just get... I get in a guy's head a little bit and I think that for, for the very short period uh, you know I, I was bowling really well and and got him and I think at that point you know as I said earlier and the, I probably had a little bit more whip in my action and and was hitting the hitting the crease pretty well and you know just just bowled well for for a series but that that first game where you have a really good match is, is like you know it's a it's a release of pressure you know because it there's a a, a sort of a flippant Charlie Brown saying of like, you know, there's no greater, no heavier burden in the world than a great potential. And I think that, um, you know, talented sports people of any kind, but certainly in cricket, it's such a mental game um, that, you know, that burden of potential is just carries, you, you know, you carry it like a huge weight, you know? Um, and it's not until you, you have that release valve of one great performance that you can just go, oh, I can breathe, <laughs> you know. I am good enough. I belong here, uh, and that was um, that was what that game was, um, you know. So I, I think I got six in the first innings and five in the second, and yeah, as you say, got fifty, um, batted pretty well, and just that. But playing at Lords, you know, I often wonder how England ever win a Test at Lords. I mean, if you as an international cricketer, if you can't get up for a game there, you know, you got the honours board mm. there. You've you know, you've got the all the history and everything that goes with it. I mean, if you're ever going to play your best game of cricket, it's going to be there, you know, as an international player, I think. Um, and so, and, it, and it's, it's such a unique experience. But, um, but yeah, I mean, and it's also one of those games I look back on. I, it, there's a bit of um, regret also because, you know, I, after that, I went and played county cricket in, in England. I got a contract at Middlesex and, you know, I was still only, I think, 23. And I just, I, I was just too young. You know, I didn't, didn't have the, I always remember playing that season at Middlesex, that first season and playing um, Worcester and Tom Moody, the Australian all-rounder. He was sort of the only guy, I remember he was, he was the pro at, at Worcester and I was the pro at Middlesex. And I played this game against Worcester. We beat them and I, and I got some wickets and charged in and tried to bowl as fast as I could. And, I remember him having a beer with me at the end of the game and he's him saying, Hey, look, you know, you need to follow what some of these West Indian guys are doing and get a short run and, and, you know, bowl within yourself. This is a long season and, you know, you're going to, you're going to injure yourself and get, you know, if you don't learn how to manage it. And I was just too young and dumb to listen, you know, but he's the one guy that tried to, tried to help me, you know, yeah. and I, I always, I always sort of say so shout out to Tom Moody. I think he is a great guy. Um, but um, I just wish I had of, had another couple of meetings with a guy like that, you know, and he could just to sort of help me cement what he was saying. Cause I remember walk, going away and thinking, oh, is he just trying to screw with my head? You know, is this one of me to bowl a bit slow? <laughs> you know, but you're just young and, and stupid, you know? Yeah. Um, and I didn't, and whether I could have changed it anyway, but you know, at the end of that season, I was just exhausted. Um, you know, I played, I remember you playing in county cricket, you play four days and then there's always a one day, there's a Sunday league game and then there's a 60 over game. And then after that 60 over game stops in, there's a 50 over, you know, and the 40 overs on the it's Sunday. Heavy and it's it's heavy and a, especially as a fast bowler, opening bowler. It's a, and, it's and if you're winning, and if you're winning, you're not getting knocked out. So you keep, you're always in the competition. And so middle six was always in the competition. And so, and you know, some days you'd, you'd finish on the, 
on the Sunday game, and then you'd jump in a car and you'd drive to Durham, you know, for six hours or wherever, you know, because you had to play on the on the Tuesday or whatever it was. Um, and so um, I just wasn't prepared for it, you know, physically or mentally. And I and I, I remember John Embry was having his um, you know, what is it, you know, his ceremonial his last year where they go around and do all the fundraising, you know, what's that called? Um, testimonial year. Yep, testimonial and, um, year. Yep, yep. So and so I was doing I was playing sort of five or six days a week for Middlesex and then I'd play a six six aside tournament for him to help on the on the night, on the day off, you know. It was just dumb. <laughs> you're like, yeah, just too much. Too, too yeah, much. yeah. And I and and I so I came home just exhausted and yeah, you know, was it sure enough, I sort of struggled through the next sort of season for New Zealand, you know, and I and and did okay. Went to the tour of India, but then I went to the West Indies and 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 I remember picking up a my bag off the conveyor belt at the West Indies and I just turned like that and felt my back go and yeah. um I I blew my disc out. And I was just, you know, and so, and again, that was one of those frustrations of like, at that stage, people were only really looking for, for stress fractures, you know, so I, I would, I, I, first of all, I tried to stay on on tour and play, then I flew to England where, because I had the second year of my middle six contract, and I got there, and I just remember everyone sort of thought I was just, um, you know, having a bit of a laugh, you know, and I remember Chris Ken's um, sort of like, um, ringing me up and going hey man you're right because he's at nottingham uh and i remember saying, sort of just joking and saying oh no i'm just having a bit of a bit of a holiday you know just i'll be right da, da, da. and i remember just sort of thinking that was probably how people were perceiving that i, I was but it, deep down i was like i was just really confused i was like no no stress fractures were coming up on the x-rays or whatever and i, I was like man but there's something really wrong because i because i it's just got a stabbing pain and you know it feels yep. like someone's cutting you with a knife um, and so, yeah, I, in the end, I just had to hand in my contract at Middlesex and, you know, it was always that little bit of bad taste when you leave. Cause I, I knew that people didn't understand and, and I, and I, they thought I'd, I'd given up and, and, and so you, you carry that with you, but I, th I, I hopefully, you know, I was out for 18 months and I thought I actually at the, at the, you know, apex of that time, I thought my career was def definitely over, you know, and, um, and I just couldn't work it out. And, then, and I, I, so I started, I, how I thought I would come back is I, I thought I'm going to come back as a batsman, you know. And then um, so I just started batting and then I made the, sort of working myself up and then I made the Northern Districts team. And then I just started bowling off two or three paces, you know. And then I slowly over uh, a, a year later, I was bowling off a half a run-up, like Tom Moody had said. <laughs> and, um, and I sort of, by that stage, the New Zealand selectors were already starting to look again. I was like, man, I'm not even, I'm not even half fit, guys. I, you know, it's, um, but I, but I definitely want to play for you. And so I, um, I ended up going back into the New Zealand team, and I really wasn't fit enough to do it. But you know, I, I, I was, I wanted to play. So you never turn down an opportunity. But sort of that second half of my career, I always sort of, sort of was always somewhere struggling with an injury of some kind. You know. The joys of being a fast bowler. Eh? It's not all it's cracked. It's not all it's cracked up to be. Um, it's it's a tough. It's, it's one of the most injury prone skills in sport to do. I mean, the, 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 the I think when you hit the when your front leg hits that hits that wicket, which is very very hard. There's a lot of pressure that goes through the body. Um, so there is lots of injuries, and and I, and I don't think you're the first that would have played through pain as well i mean it's it's just part and parcel of being a fast bowler in the latter part of your career you bowl in a lot in a lot of pain um if i was to so you played looking at it 1992 to around 2001 you played for the black caps um 32 test matches 93 wickets uh 81 odi 64 wickets what would you say in that time frame that period if you were to pick out the top three memories, what stood out for you in, in, in that time? Uh, yeah, so, well, obviously, 94 was always that test and that tour of England. Um, and then 99, tour of England, for sure. Um, those two really stand out. Um, and then the final tour for me was a, we played, a, we knocked Australia out of their home series. We played a Carlton United series in Australia. 
um, it's a tri series between us, South Africa, and and Australia. And you know, we played some pretty amazing cricket in Australia. And that's always one of those little benchmarks, you know, like you you have to front up over there uh, to really earn your spot you know, in your stripes. And um, and I think we did on that tour. Um, and I think you know, Shane Bond was just coming into the team back then. Um, I want to say maybe even someone like Brendan McCallum might have been on that tour for the first time. I don't maybe didn't play much, but um, <clears throat> certainly it was a changing of the guard, and you felt that. But you know, you know, myself and a few of the older guys still managed to put some pretty good performances on, and it was a sort of felt like a nice way to to end. Um, I was definitely at that stage at the end of my tether. I think you're you're right what you said before about injuries. There's not a fast bowler who's played the game who isn't paid played through pain. Um, but I also think one of the things that you can't, no, no one can share that experience with you, you know, so your teammates and the media and you, and you get judged on your performance, not on how much pain you're putting, putting up yep. with, you know, and, and it's sort of like, um, it's one of those things that you just it becomes really tiring because you sort of like you rightfully people are sort of saying, oh, like he's not bowling with the heat he used to bowl. And all you can think in your head is just how unfair those sorts of comments are because they can't understand. But no one can understand so and so it, t- it tires you out mentally as well as and then you know going to the physio's room um but one of the joys is also it's just when you are an older player and you see that changing of the guard is you sort of sit those little moments of, of swapping over you know guys like jacob worm and you know coming into the team and you sort of go oh no this guy's gonna we're gonna be a good team you know um and and all those little things that you sort of go, yeah, actually, we're leaving it better than when we found it. I think I think you can be proud of those sort of moments, you know. I mean, yeah, it's gone from strength to strength. I mean, you look at you just need to look at where New Zealand cricket is now. Um, and yeah, a lot of you guys and the guys before you and the Martin Crows of the world will have paved the way for the Caden Williamsons to now be one of the best best players in the world. And you know, it's it, I love watching I love watching the Kiwis play. Um you, one big question I want to ask is, who's the, who would you say is the best that you played with and who's the best you played against? You're only allowed one. So I'm not giving oh. you, I'm not giving oh. you four or five options. You have to just go the best and the best. Oh my gosh. Okay. So the most dominant player I ever played against. Yep. Is Wazi Makram. Just, and, and, I, but I could pick five others right behind I bet you him. Could. I, bet, I bet you could. But that's, that when, but that's when the term the best kind of goes away because then you've got 10, yeah. ten of the best. Yeah. So that's why I said, yeah. listen, why is he Macram? Why is he Yeah, yeah. Was, it, was he Macram? Um, just because he was he was like a wild bull, you know, like he was just a at a different level to the rest of us. I remember facing him and it was like, I first felt like he could hit me at any time. I didn't. I don't know which way it was swinging. It was too fast for me. I, he was in my head. Everything about him was just so powerful, you know. And and I think that he just sort of. There's not many players I would say blew me away, and he but he blew me away. You know, he was just way too good. And 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 you sort of like, you know, the only caveat on that is you sort of reserve to the right to get better against people if you play against them enough. And I, I probably never had enough of a sustained period of playing against them to sort of try to work out a, a strategy against them. You know, some other great players, I probably played enough times that I overcame that, you know, a little bit and was able to sort of mentally get in the game against them. But with Wazim, that just never happened. Um, and then the best player I played with, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I probably would have to say Martin Crow. Um, yeah, I, I think Martin Crow was just at another level of the compared to the other guys, and I include myself in that. He he sort of was playing at a higher plane, you know. He'd got himself there, which made him a really difficult character to play with um, and to be, understand and be around at times. Um, but he was, you know, he helped um, me understand the level you needed to get to if you're going to perform, um, and and I think that probably. He showed a lot of us that, um, and we didn't get to play with him for long enough. You know, if he if he had been able to play for another three or four years, I think we really would have got more out of him. But um, wasn't to be. 
two pretty good choices. Um, both phenomenal cricketers. Ninety two World Cup in particular is my my memory of both of them. Um, and I, and Wazi Makram in that World Cup final will will live on in memory. Just that spell was uh, I pretended in the back garden many a time. I was Wazi Makram. So um, great great to, great to hear you hear you pick him. You also had a wee stint of being a leader yourself. Stephen Fleming got injured. And this is uh, more towards the back end of your career, and you got the you got the role of captaining. How did you find that? How did you enjoy that? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, it was um, obviously a huge honour to captain the national side. Um, and I always probably knew that it was a temporary situation, so I didn't carry the burden of I'm going to have to do this for a long time. I was able to come in and give it energy and understand. And you know, I, I, I also probably never wanted it for a long time. I think um, it, I, I thought it. I thought captaincy, you know, as much as we respect um, Stephen Fleming now in retrospect as a you know, great New Zealand captain, um, I think it, it curtailed his career as a, as a player um, very much, certainly in the early days. Um, and, you know, he said a, that's not to take away anything in his career. He, you know, he had a wonderful career, um, elegant, great batsman. But um, I definitely think in the early days it, it, he did – you know, it stopped him probably achieving as much as he could have as a batsman, um, and was a burden that you know, as a young guy, you know, he had to to front to to carry. So, um, but I, I certainly enjoyed it, and I think you know, the, probably for me, the timing of it, it was probably a good break for Flem as well. You know, he he was only out for like maybe it was only a month or three weeks. I can't remember. Maybe maybe a month, I think. But it was. Um, it was probably a nice break for him, you know, just to freshen up, have someone else step in, um, and and him get get some perspective on it. So I think it helped everybody. Um, certainly, um, you know, I, I, at that time, I, I don't, you know, I think there it was an easy job to do because we had at that point transitioned to having number of leaders in the team. You know, we had Gavin Larson was still playing, um, Roger Tews was there, Chris Kins, Adam Perori, Nathan Astle. Yeah, so it wasn't like I was, um, you know, leading a, a bunch of uh, guys who didn't know what they were doing. These are all hardened international cricketers who really knew the game. But you still have to make the calls on the field, and I enjoyed that. And I remember, particularly, I remember a game we played down in Dunedin. We played South Africa one day game, um, and at the end of halfway, we ended up winning the game. Um, and and but halfway through the game, when we bowled. Um, Gavin Larson, who I had a lot of time and respect for, um, at the end of the first innings, came off and said, "Really well, Captain Bay." You know, and I just thought that was a really nice, nice sort of badge. You know, that that I earned his respect just through through that little bit. Um, we it was a really tight game actually. I remember we we only just got across the line, um, but we beat South Africa, and again it, that was meaningful because they were one of those teams that had you know had sort of our number at that period of time so I sort of pride myself on that we also I think had a couple of really close games against India um, so it was it was cool it was a really good time it was, it was a, and the team was playing really well as well so it was a, a nice time to be playing and be part of the group very proud moment for your for your family for everybody you know captain in your country you know everyone gets to do that so you know good for you and, and a nice nice thing for you to happen in your because it was more towards probably the, the latter part of your, your career as well. Yeah. Um, what was retirement like? It's a big moment yeah, in anybody's, and anybody's, and especially somebody like yourself who's played the game at the highest level possible. What was that like? Uh, it's hard. You know, cricket gets its, you know, as much as I, I didn't start out being a cricketer, you know, by the time I was 12 or 13, I was a cricketer. And so, but so said by 13, it's just, it was so 13 through to 30 when I retired, you know, you know, it's a long time formative years where you think of yourself as all your dreams or your ambition, everything that you've laid out for yourself is tied up in one thing. Um, and then at the age of 30, which was young, you know, I knew I was giving up early. Um, I was having to walk away and, and, um, you know, I just had too many injuries and, and didn't, couldn't, couldn't come back anymore. And, and so, look, it took three or four years. And, I, and to be honest, I'm, here I am nearly 50. And, you know, I still think of myself more as a cricketer than anything else I've done. Um, you know, so it gets its, it gets its um, 
hooks in really deep, you know, that cricket game and those careers thing. And, um, and so, and it's hard to give up and hard to walk away from. And, and, you know, so it, everyone who retires from top level sport has to go through it. There's no escaping it. Um, but it's not an easy process. Certainly I didn't find it easy. Um, and I, 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 what I am grateful for is, um, you know, having, um, the opportunity now to put some creative energy into my business and and do new things and and put that sort of I, I think sports people and well certainly I am that we have this this an achievement we want to be achieving something and 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 having something to tip our energy into and I think I can understand why lots of sports people end up you know with gambling addictions or or you know losing all their money and and you know end up you know uh, on the on the um, rubbish tip so to speak um, and that that's that, because it's it's just you need to be putting yourself and putting your energy into something constructive otherwise you become destructive on yourself you know uh, I, I honestly believe I, and understand that process you know um, and so um, I just feel a bit blessed at the moment that I was able to stumble across a business and and an idea and put my energy into that rather than something less destructive and I and and also having a, a wife who understands sports. And my wife plays netball, played netball for New Zealand. Um, you know, she was a, she was a captain and you know, she was a better netballer than I was a cricketer, let's put it that way. Um, and, um, and, you know, so her, having her go through that process at a similar time and just having the understanding of each other that, you know, when you're having a bad day, you know, there's lots of demons you're wrestling with and some of them just can't be explained to normal people. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can talk, I, I can relate to. Um, I, I kind of stopped playing the game at the highest level probably around the age of twenty eight. Mine was for a little bit more controversial reasons. I, I, I said and did some things that maybe I should I, I shouldn't have done. Um, and you know, I, I'm thirty six now and, I, and I'm fine. I'm fine to say that. But for three or four years after that is probably where I, you know, the really strange years that I look back at and think it was just. Didn't really know what I was. Didn't really know what I was doing, and um, and and this podcast actually is is something that at the start of lockdown, after unfortunately losing my job, I, I put my energy into this. And I think if I didn't have my podcast for the last year and a half, I would have went, I would have went down down a, down a path that probably wouldn't have been so great for me. So I can totally yeah. relate to what you're saying there with your business and putting your energy into something else and being creative because you're used to playing and doing things at the top level and achieving and beating South Africa and beating Australia and Australia, it's hard to get that feeling in other areas of life. So good for you. For uh, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll, come, we'll, we'll come on to that just in a second. But two things I wanted to ask you, just finishing off on the cricket front, is after retirement, you had a stint as a national selector in 2005. How did yes. you find that experience? I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I don't think I, I think I, I would love to sort of have um, do it at a different time with different players. Cause I was in, in the end, I was, um, you know, selecting guys or dropping guys that I'd played with. And I think that was a little hard, um, you know, um, because guys took it personally, you do take it personally, you know? Yep. Um, so I think in a way it damaged my relationship with a few people, um, you know, and I, I, in particular, I think Stephen Fleming, you know, at that stage he was coming sort of to the end and we we're trying to get this sort of transition between you know him which now everyone does you know which is the cap have a test captain and a one day captain and a t20 captain you know that's a, that's a, just a thing you do now but i remember at the time we were trying to wrestle with how do we bring on a new leader and still keep steven in the team and all that sort of stuff and i you know i think like i you know in retrospect i should just pick up the phone and talk to steven and said hey this is what we're trying to do um uh, he may not still have understood it or, or agreed with it, but I, but I just remember thinking, but that conversation never happened. And we just, and I think we left it up to the coach to sort of do it. So there are little things when you look back and you go, Oh, if I had my time again, there's different ways to do it. But what was amazing was working with Richard Hadley and Glenn Turner, who were the two other selectors at the time and having that chance to sort of that cross generational sort of um, working relationship with two guys I have huge respect for um not always seen eye to eye with like Glenn Turner and Richard both uh, you know at times uh, you know I, I I didn't sort of see eye to eye with but um and then but with but learning to 
understand how they think, their interpretation of the game, um, what they see in the game, and and just their strengths and, and things. So it was it was a real eye opener and, and a great opportunity, and something I actually really really cherish because, you know, I'd always think fondly of those two guys. You know, like Richard Headley was just so thorough. Uh, you know, as was Glenn Turner, they, you know, their statistics of, and knowledge of the game and what they brought to the table. And, you know, Richard had a pretty sort of like simple philosophy on things, you know, uh, and the players picked themselves um, through their performance. Um, Glenn was probably more driven from a, um, look, here's how we should be playing the game. And these are the guys who I think, based on their statistics, can fit these roles. Um, you know, and there's, there's room for that way of thinking as well. And um, and but also with Glenn, I found that if if you didn't disagree with Glenn, he would assume you agreed with him. You know, which is, you know, and there's a lot of people out there who are like that. You know, and and, um, and so you had to it forced me to say, hey, no, Glenn, I actually don't agree with that. You know, and then he would respect that situation. You know, he he, he was a very respectful guy, um, and and then you know it was it was a wonderful um, time. Um, I, as I said, I, I sort of probably learned more from it personally than I than I felt like I did a good job at it, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I get you. I get you evolved. And probably if you'd done it five years later, you probably would have yes. be, do, done it done it even done it even better. And then probably not yeah. had to bring personal relationships into it because that's right. Yeah. Either would have been yeah. would have been gone. Um yeah. well there's still time. Maybe the phone will maybe the phone will get picked up <laughs> and they'll, they'll call upon your services again. So never 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 yeah. say never. Something else that I found really interesting, 2008, got back on to, got back into the cricket scene again, this time on the old beach. You played some <laughs> cricket for the New Zealand beach cricket team. How, uh, how was that for you? Oh, that was awesome. I mean, we got to play, we flew on a plane again with all these old guys to Perth, got to go out, you know, have, have drinking with, you know, them and um, Dennis Lee and Jeff Thompson, you know, my childhood heroes, you know. Um, you know, Graham Gooch was there, like all these, you know, it was, it was um, Angus Fraser who had played at Middlesex. So just a really wonderful time um, to sort of just chill out. And the South Africans came the next year. And so Hansi Kron, not, uh, not Hansi Kron, yeah, um, Fani de Villiers and um, John T. Rhodes, all these guys you'd battled with, you know. I remember Fani de Villiers saying, get, you know, having a few drinks at a barbecue after and going, Actually, you're you know basically saying I was a good bastard, and not and not the ass ass that he thought I was when he played against me, <laughs> you know. And I remember thinking, yeah, something similar to you, uh, Fanny. That happens often, though. <laughs> that happens often. I bet, I bet you found that often in your career when you would actually yeah. sit down and talk to somebody that you've probably been playing yeah. against for ages. They're actually decent yeah. balls, but on a cricket. Yeah, pitch, and it, and actually, you're much more like each other than 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 not like each other, you know. Uh, but that's probably that that sort of like two magnets sort of um, you know hitting into it. But I, I, it was a wonderful experience, and you know we got to go. And, and you know you talk about retirement. I think that part of that experience helped me heal a little bit from all of the regrets of cricket that I had, you know. Um, and I think I also think just going back to that retirement thing, it's impossible not to retire without regret. You know, like it, no matter what level or standard you've hit the game. I mean, you know, you might say maybe Section Tendulkar or someone like that might have retired um, without regret. But I, even Section, I'm sure, thinks in Rue's opportunities that he had, you know, that he should have scored more runs and, and done better. And and so we all have that and we all carry it forward. And and, um, and I think so those things like that beach cricket was just that wonderful opportunity to, um, to sit down and, and share stories, heal some old wounds, um, you know, enjoy each other's company a little bit, and, um, and and just have a bit of fun. And but I do what I, one thing I do remember is we turned up to um, a beach in Perth, and we'd all had a big night the night before because we were you know meeting our heroes, you know Dennis Lee, and I was like, man, I, I had a poster on my wall. Done. And anyway, we all drove out to this beach. It's about twenty minutes from this bus, and we got to the beach. Um, in Perth, not really knowing what, what we were turning up to. And then there's this sort of like, this, this all the way down the street was um, all these people queuing up at, at the beach. And I was like, I just thought to myself, man, I wonder what's on here today. And then this nervous laughter <laughs> broke out through the bus as we realised 
all these people are here to watch us play beach cricket. Yeah. <laughs> then 6,000 people turn out to this a little arena at, in Perth. And I, I was just like, oh my gosh, I, <laughs> what's going on? So um, it was just that funny. Were you, were you, were you, funny were you, were you any good? Were you any good at beat? Was, 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 it was great. It was so much fun because you have a ball, it was like a tennis ball with rubber on one side. So I used to hope, like, so it's like bowling reverse, reverse swing. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so no, it was, it was, it was awesome. Great game. It was, it was really fun to play. It was, um, and everyone took it seriously. It was played really, really seriously. And we all beat the, the, the English and, and the Kiwis smashed the Aussies, which they hated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet, well, that's the two men. That's up there as the two main rivals. Um, but I'm sure you guys, I'm sure you you guys enjoyed it, and there was some uh, some banter in the bar afterwards as well. After a couple of these couple of these games, but it sounds sounds like a great a great gig. Changing now, completely off subject, and and going into the life of of Dion, Dion Nash now. Triumph and disaster, um, skincare brand. Um, I, I take it this is the business you were referring to earlier on. Tell me about. The story behind it, how it came about, and 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 what's happening, and where the business has got to. Yes, well, it's sort of um, it started because I got into business. I I I um, after cricket was searching for what I wanted to do. Got involved with a few guys, New Zealand entrepreneurs. They did a a New Zealand vodka business, which I ended up working for. I I built a water company with them um, under the under the uh, as sort of a subsidiary of the business anyway they sold it to Bacardi and my water business got sold with it um and I ended up going and running the, the vodka and uh, for Bacardi because all of the guys who started it left it got their money and left and um and so I had sort of seven or eight years of working in this business and understanding young entrepreneurs and then um you know the, the full uh, gambit of uh, a big American corporate and and it was a sort of interesting journey, um, but I was moved to asked to move to England to run it in England, and I I had a young family by that stage, and I was like, oh, I I was a bit stale, um, and I thought, well, I need to if I'm going to ever have a go, now's the time. Um, so I took redundancy instead of moving to England, and um, I literally didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but I sat in my last meeting was in a meeting in New York. Uh, this young guy back in 2009 or 10 uh, had a vest on and he had a sleeve tattoo and, you know, he was well groomed. And then the meeting pulled out like a hand cream or something and then a lip balm. And I was like, oh, this is weird. And I, and I on the plane back um, home, I kept thinking, man, I use moisturizer because in the sun from cricket all the time that, you know, I remember Ken Rutherford when I was about 20 catching me using a moisturizer in Dunedin and he was like he looked at me in the afternoon and was like what what are you putting sunscreen on at this time of day for you know we'd, we were batting and he was finished feeling I was like oh you can never be too safe Ken you know yeah. <laughs> but it was like I was actually moisturizing and I was like it was like um it was so far outside of his frame of reference that I could be putting moisturizer on that it was like, you know, couldn't even, it didn't even I can recognize imagine. it. I can imagine. <laughs> so, so I, um, so I remember, but I remember thinking on the plane, I remember thinking, oh, I mean, if I could make something cool, if it fell out of my cricket bag and people didn't feel embarrassed, but actually, and then, and I also thought, well, well, you know, by the time I finished in sort of 2001 or whatever, pretty much all the guys were using some sort of skincare regime, you know, because it, yeah, you're in the sun, you got to wash the sunscreen off every day. You don't want a dry skin, all that sort of stuff. So it was just a pragmatic industrial sort of exposure to, to a small regime of, you know, of not using soap on your face, things like that. So I thought, oh, I actually know I've got some sort of competitive advantage here. I know this stuff. Um, what if I went and just rebuilt my regime that I've been using and tried to sell that to dudes and see if that works. And that was literally the extent of the idea. Um, and so I was off. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll give that a go. And then one day I was like, it started to get a bit real. You know, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to come out of the closet as a moisturizer user. You know, this is going to be really bad. Any Bobble street cred I Bobble might Ken, have. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I was, uh, if I had any cred, it was all about to go. So I was like, man, I've got to make this logical for guys. How do I do that? So I was trying to wrestle with well what are guys doing i was like oh they, most guys shave so if i start with shaving and i get them to clean clean their face first and then 
protected afterwards. I was like, I can make that like sort of this handed down advice because I was I mean, you learned to shave from your dad, you know, or your or your granddad or whoever, your older brother. So I was like, ah, oh, and I was playing around with this idea of handed down advice. And then I literally, my dad had given me this poem by Rudyard Kipling called If, which is advice on how to live your life. Um, and Rudyard Kipling gave it to his son. And dad gave it to me. And I was like, and there's this line, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. And then the last line of the poem is, you'll be a man, my son. And I was like, oh, that's the name. And then um, that was it. Once I got that name and, and sort of that idea of handing down advice and making it rational and logical for guys and get rid of that icky sort of feeling of using moisturizer. I thought, ah, I can do this. So that was sort of the, the quick short story of how it all came about. Um, yeah. And I mean, as far as I, I, I've looked into, I mean, you're now in kind of high street brands of the likes of Selfridges and stuff like that over in the, over in the UK. Um, so it's obviously. You've yeah. We're, up. We're on Mr. Porter, which is a you know huge one that's that's really great to be on. We're on Liberties in London, um, John Bell and Croydon of Croydon. We've got some good accounts, also some high end barbers. You know, really good. We've benefited from that sort of you know um, renaissance of barbers that's happened all around the world. Um, and I think guys now are looking after themselves and are really familiar with the idea of like, hey, I, it, you know, it's okay to take a bit of care on how I look and feel. And it's more about how I feel rather than how I look, right? I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we've all there's a little bit of vanity in all of us, um, I'm sure. But um, it's also just trying to promote that idea of um, look, if you if you clean your face and and spend a bit of time just gathering yourself in the morning, you're actually going to have a much better experience. Um, during the day you know you've taken that time to calm yourself and it's a bit meditative a little bit ritual um, and then obviously it actually works too it looks after you know you feel better for it so um, uh, I, I think there's it's a it's been well we're 10 years in now and and you know it's been a, a journey I've le certainly learned a lot learned more probably about managing people and being a, a leader in this business than I did in cricket um, and, and people always talk about the parallels between sport and business and there are some, but there's also some things that are really at odds with each other, you know, and, um, and you, you just have to learn those things. Well, I'll put my hands up and say I'm a regular moisturiser in the morning, the shower, <laughs> and in the evening, good wash of the face, always moisturising. Um, so I think it's very, very, very important and good that you got into it because that's probably, you know, would have been something that you were probably thinking about often being a cricketer you know like you say the skin takes especially playing in countries like New Zealand and Australia it's um it's known for having skin problems etc so good that you've that you've done that good that you've got to 10 years a lot of people try to start businesses and they you know they they can't quite get it going or it flops so amazing amazing achievement and I'm sure that's taking you forward in the next phase of your life and got brought you that contemptness rather than because you lose that void of cricket and and playing at the top level, I'm sure the business and seeing people have bought. How many people do you have in your team? What what kind of numbers are, are in your business? Well, <laughs> until recently we had um we had eleven, so it was the cricket team. So I've, I've we're down to ten. We're a man short at the moment. Um, what but, are you looking um, for a spin? What are you looking for a left arm spinner <laughs> or a top order bat? Sort of a sort of a stoic middle order batsman who just you know really can't with a bit of everything. Yeah, does a little bit a little bit with the with the ball, you know. Can can whack it at the end as well if need be. Oh, well, listen, I'll keep my eyes out for somebody for you. See if we can get, see if we can get a couple of CVs, CVs your way. What do you think of the game of cricket now? Yeah, great question. Shoot, it's um changed. I I, I think it's great. Um, I don't think I don't think I could have been a T Twenty player. I don't think I could have handled. I don't think my head could have handled getting smacked for six. Uh, uh, so regularly, um, but I just think the game's evolved really quickly. I, the one, I, I, you know, you just look at it, you know how young bowlers are coming into the game and the, the 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 assets or the arsenal that they've got now in terms of their their slow balls, their variations. It's it's they've definitely evolved as have the batters. There's there's parts that have sort of probably devolved. You know, like I think if you you know it's interesting watching Jimmy Anderson, who's obviously a great bowler. But you know he's just bowling out swingers down down the channel. You know, back in the day that just got those those got left for time and immeasurable. You know, but now 
people aren't prepared to leave it as long. And I think there's, you know, that, that those techniques of, of, of the game and, and sort of hitting hard through the line have made it sort of better to watch, more boundaries, but also quicker to get wickets as well. So I think the game has evolved along lines. And, and some people will call that it won't enjoy that. I, but I think actually, for the most part, the game is a much better game to watch. And I think you can see that in the, in the results of the crowds. But I, I think the, other, the only thing that's missing for me that really got me into the game is, um, you know, back in the, watching the West Indians play back in the day, there was that real danger element from fast bowlers. And I sort of sense that that's gone out of the game a touch. Yeah. And I, I would like to see, you know, whether it's just rule changes, every rule change that's happened seems to have favoured the batters in the last 20 years. And it's like, how about we get a couple back in just to even the balance back up? You know, like I think when you've got a guy, when you've got guys who the fear's gone out of them, that they can just play any shot. To me, you've gone a little bit too far. <clears throat> I think you've got to be able to, you know, just bring, even if it's just get the wickets a little bouncier, you know, just so, just something, does, maybe it's not rule changes, maybe it's just, you know, instead of having real flat batting tracks that bullies just come in and smack guys, you know, when you've got guys who are bowling 150 and they get smacked back out of their head regularly, maybe, if, maybe you know, we need to look at the game a little bit. Well, I think that's where the fine in my opinion, and, and following on from what you're saying, that's where the fine line is between between T20 and the greatest form for me, and, and I'm assuming for you as well, is test cricket. It's the ultimate test of any batsman, any bowler. Um, but T20, I mean, if you're a young quick coming through now, do you want to bowl four overs every other week and make a fortune, or do you want to bowl 25 to 30 overs a day? Like, I think that's why some of these things are starting to slip out of the game. You're right. If you look across all the test playing nations just now, there isn't any frightening quick attacks like there once. I mean, there once was the West Indies. You talked about Wazim and Wakar. You know, you had a lot of these really the, the Aussies. You mentioned them too as well, Lily and Thompson. It's not quite it's not quite there the same anymore. And you're right. It's not quite as exciting to watch that contest because of it, unless it's getting played in England. Where the balls <laughs> yeah. still get a bit, they get a bit of extra, a bit of extra movement out of the conditions. But yeah, no, I, I would, always laugh. I always laugh at like when you, you know, Alan Donald's another one you'd throw in there. But I, oof, I always oof, laughed oof. at how, 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 how like all you, all you wanted to do was when you met the the opposition fast bowler, like he was like, "G'day, Alan, how are you? Good breakfast this morning." You know, <laughs> you go out of your way to try to have a nice friendly conversation with him before the start of play. <laughs> You know, having had a did sleepless you, night. You, you faced a fair few then. You faced Waz even Wacker. Um, did you face Alan Donald a few times then as well? Alan Donald. Alan Donald hit me in the head. Yep. Um, and I hit him for six back over his head a couple of years later. That was pleasant, pleasing to, to know. Where was it? Where, where, where was it? I'd imagine the next one wasn't in your half. No. <laughs> and I knew it was coming and I still couldn't catch up with it. <laughs> oh, great, it was like, great. Whew, still going up. Great bowler. So, uh, Beautiful action. Yeah, they were... Oh, and fast and really fast. They, eh? you know, like frighteningly fast. Brett Lee is another one. Um, Shaw Bechter, another one. They will. It's funny though, different ones. Um, like I, out of all of those, Walker, Brett Lee, Shaw, um, Alan Donald, they all gave you a really good look at the ball. And Wazim was the one for me. I was just like, God, where's the ball? It was like this magic trick, you know? And then, it was, yeah. then all of a sudden it was there. And I was like, oh. Still haven't seen it. <laughs> but what about, the, but Walsh, I think, what about Walsh and Ambrose, that, that height factor? I never faced Ambrose, um, but Walsh um, faced him a few times. Yeah, Walsh is probably at the end of his career by that stage, so he's still a really fine bowler. But um, I think he got me out with a slow ball in Jamaica once, which was embarrassing because it was so slow that I, I, you know, I was probably coming back around uh, the second time. But, um, I mean, the guys that really got you jumping, you know, I remember Brett Lee um, and... Alan Donald and and um, you know Walker in particular, um, those guys were just express, you know, express. No other way to say it. I faced two balls off Brett Lee, and I don't think I seen either one. And it was in, <laughs> in Edinburgh on a pretty slow wicket as well. I don't think he was bowling at full pelt. But my days, it was it was quick. So I'd only imagine when he's playing against the Kiwis, how quick he would yeah. be bowling. Um, brings us pretty much to the to the end of. The end of our chat. Um, it's been a pleasure, real pleasure talking to you. 
you've given some uh, I get some great some great insights into your career. Very honest as well. Um, what's your kind of what's the future hold now for for you, Mister Nash? What's what's your future aspirations? Any of the kids likely to go down the sporting route? Uh, yeah, I've got three kids, so um, we've, we've got three. Though oldest one's fifteen, he's sitting here. We're in lockdown, so he's. I'm, he's I did see him one night. He wants to sit in room back, Dad. So yeah, so uh, so well, fifteen, thirteen, and eleven are my kids, and so it's really all about them, all about business, all about family, and and really that's the sort of foreseeable future. Loving, loving sort of um, that at the moment, and um, yeah, they uh, all my kids. Are, love sport they all play multiple sports um you know but um uh we're not pushing them it's like <clears throat> you know you've got it it's a tough lifestyle sport and you've got to really love it i think you know apart from being talented you've got to have that ambition and drive and love of the game um it's, it's a it's a heady cocktail that you have to have and put together to to sort of play it at the top level and 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 sustain it and you know, that might not be, that's something I think you've got to arrive at on your own terms and decide that you want to put that cocktail together. Um, so uh, life's a, it's rich enough. We don't need to push people into, into things they don't want to do. So I don't know. We'll see. I, obviously, I love watching them play. Um, you know, the oldest one has a, got a beautiful bowling action and he's going to be nice and tall. So hits a bit hard. Um, youngest one's a rugby player. You know, loves scoring tries and, and doing well. And my daughter in the middle, she's a takes after her mother. Um, so good netball player. So we, you know, we just love watching it. But you know, the the other thing is, you know, they all play musical instruments and trying to get them in to study their maths and English because I was I was always really good at that, right? <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> It's probably more important. The irony of um, of telling them to study their maths. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, it's been a it's been an absolute pleasure. Like I said, I watched a lot of you play cricket. Who would have ever thought? Many years later, I'd be sitting recording a podcast with you. It just shows you the power of the world and connections and somebody like yeah. Joey putting us in touch. And it, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much for coming on today. No worries. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, well, enjoy. Um, hopefully, the Rangers are behaving themselves out there. Well, um, the, the fireworks, the fireworks have calmed down. Um, <laughs> they, they do a twelve. I think they do a twelve noon kickoff, and I think that's to make sure that they're all home by <laughs> a reasonable time. So the streets have gone a lot quieter now. Um, but yeah, one team. There's always one. There's always one team that's very disappointed and sat as it is for Celtic today. Me being a Rangers fan. Uh, we, we, we're taking your blood it's, but uh, no I appreciate that again thank you very much for your time stay cool see you